All right. So today let's do evolution. Evolution by definition means change over time. Now, when we talk about time, we not talk about two days, three weeks, one year, or a hundred year. More likely, if this would be a test, change over time, it could be like this, right? But when we talk about evolution or evolution in biological terms, we refer to hundreds of years or even more, maybe a thousand year or maybe 10,000 year. Why? Because on geological time scale, uh, um, a few weeks or a few days or a couple years means nothing. Earth is about five, uh, sorry, one, about 1 1.5 billion years old. So it's pretty old compared with our age. So here you can see that change occurs in organisms over time. Now these changes over time, this change itself over time takes place at DNA level. Why at DNA level? Because DNA holds the key, holds the key information of how you look. A couple changes on that DNA is gonna make the difference between this and this right here. I changed the DNA just a little bit, just a little bit. You might look like this. Now, if I change it even more, you might look like a bird. If I change it even more, you might look like a mouse, depending how closely related you or, or we are on the taxonomic level. So remember, all these changes take place at DNA level. Now, the theory of evolution was established by this guy, which was called Darwin. We're going to see him, him in a minute in the Galapagos Islands. Now, what is Galapagos? Galapagos are these islands of Ecuador, about 600 miles of Ecuador in the middle of the Pacific. And it's made up of a bunch of islands right there. And hopefully you guys watch the video that I told you to watch. And then there they talk about these islands. And these islands are volcanic islands, which means that they are pretty young. They are very young islands. They are only about young islands. They are only about half a million years old, which in ge geological time scale, it's pretty young. These islands actually keep moving, keep shifting. But there's a bunch of these little islands right here. Now, today, um, only this island right here, this island right here, and this island right here, there is actually people living on it. All the other islands just basically bare. Now, on these islands, actually, even though they are so close to each other, and surrounding these islands also in the water, there's a lot of diversity. Diversity. This is the key word when we talk about evolution, diversity. The more diverse they are, the more different, more different or, or more organisms are there and they interact with each other. Now, if you notice another thing here, these islands are close to the equator. So there's a lot of sun there. Here is the Charles Darwin Scientific Center they have right there on, um, this is on Santa Cruz. It's pretty cool if you go there. Uh, I worked for uh, their institute for a couple of days too, actually, when I went there. Here, you can see what, they, what they, these islands are famous for, tortoises. When you look at them, you see these tortoises, that they have something different, right? Both of them are basically terrestrial. They live on land. Now, when you look at their uh, uh, shell or carapace, what you notice, it's the way it looks here versus here. This one, it's more rounded. The other one, it's more like a saddle. Now that's where basically the name of the islands come from, Galapagos, from Galapago or the saddle. Now, what is the difference between these two? It's basic, basically the habitat, they, they're gonna be fine. 
This one right here, since the carapace right here or the shell is mostly straight, this one cannot stretch his neck up to pick up on tall plants. So then they feed basically off the grassy uh, or grassland. This one, it's found on dry islands where there is only tall plants. Now, if you would move this one in here, it would not survive because it cannot, it cannot feed off tall plants. This one here, look at the legs, they're even taller. And then they can stretch their neck and the neck is way longer too. Look at the neck right there. So basically this one feeds off the tall plants. Here, I put an example. Uh, this guy right here, his name is Diego. And Diego used to be at uh, San Diego at the zoo. And back in 70s, he was taken back to uh, Galapagos. Why? Because there were 12 females, but no male there on Española. And <clears throat> later they found another male there. So why did they take him back? Because they had to reproduce. So that's why they take Diego back. So Diego basically now they start reproducing and they have a lot of these. Oh, these are just uh, uh, examples of it, like actually pictures that I took while I was there. These are the ones that have long necks, they live on dry islands. And you can look at this one, lives where there is the highlands, where there is some rain. By the way, I forgot to mention that even though it's at the equator, there is very little rain here on these islands. There is only some rain, some uh, water on this island and some water here. Uh, everything else, Whatever they get there is just only at high altitudes on Isabella, Santa Cruz, and San Cristobal. There's not too much rain there. There's only a rainy season in um, January. But they have these highlands or this uh, um, mountain area or, or taller area where they actually, it rains mostly. And at the bottom of the, each island, it's actually dry. It's pretty dry there. So here you can see a bunch of the babies, right? So they took them to these um, reproduction centers where they save the eggs and then they allow these little babies to grow until they're about four or five years old here. And then they reintroduce them into the, their habitat on the island. Now, how do I know how old um, each um, of these babies? Actually, you can look at these squares right here and count them like, it's a, like on a tree. Trees have little rings inside, right? Those rings tell you how old they are. So if you look right here, this one is one, two, three, three years old. This one right here, it is. Maybe four, I can see another one. So this one, it's about 40 years old. So that's how you count how old they are. And this is like basically a reproduction center. They have uh, one in uh, on San Cristobal and they have one on uh, Santa Cruz. And they have actually one in Isabella too. So they have on three, all three of them. Here is me trying to be funny. Uh, there's a little road that takes you uh, across the island. There's the only road that takes you in Santa Cruz from the airport all the way to the city. And you know, these uh, little tortoises can roam freely, but then I guess they get scared when they see me because I'm so uh, gangster. So then what they did, they just stay there. They got stuck there. So I just take a picture trying to be d uh, dumb funny right there, but I'm not. Here, what I'm trying to show you, here it's a really cool picture actually. Here I'm trying to show you how big these things are, these tortoises. When you look right there, look at me, I'm not really a big guy either, but this guy, it's about 150 pounds. Now, when you look at this one right here, this is about 400 to 500 pounds. That's how big they are. I remember, if you look right here, look at the carapace, you see how it looks like? Same thing right here, you see these ones, you can figure out what type of tortoises you have by looking at the surrounding right there. If you see a lot of grass, you expect this type of tortoises to see. If you look at dry, as you see right here, you see everything is dry. Look at the saddle right there, how beautiful it is. Now, you also notice here there is variation between the saddle, which means what? They're a little bit different. You see this one, it's a little bit more wider. It's a little bit different. That's how basically, or that's what it helps the species survive, or it helps the species um, reproduce and, uh, and in time survive the conditions on, in any island. Oops. Now, right here, you can see how probably a million years from now, that's how this is the new evolution. That's what a, 
a tortoise is going to look in a, in a million years from now. So that's, that's, that's me basically trying to eat some stuff there. And here what I do, I show you a picture. This is basically what I'm trying to show you is this is the spinal cord of the tortoises. So basically a tortoise here, it's attached to its spinal cord to the carapace itself, it's attached to it. So if you try to remove the carapace, you actually kill the, um, the tortoises. All right, now let's move actually into the geological time scale, which we need to kind of like have an idea what does that mean? A geological time scale, it's basically a, um, a scale over time of geology. Basically, you look at the rocks or the earth over time. So the earth over time, it settles in different layers to really high depth. Now, if you look from the bottom towards the top, you're going to notice that the composition of each one of these layer, it's a little bit different. And that this is how we can determine basically how the atmosphere look like because the dirt or the earth, it's settled in top, like there's layers in top of each other. And those layers are made up of particles of dust or earth. Now, those ones pick up the elements from the air. And that's how we can figure out a million years ago, how was the atmosphere or 200 million years ago when the first plants start um, popping up. That's when basically a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere start uh, uh, filling up. Now, if you look at geological time scale, it's divided into, in, into three segments, epochs, periods, eras. Now. The shorter segments are called the epochs. Then you have the periods, and then you have eras. Now, when you look right here, you can see era is the largest one, period, and epochs. Now, what I want you to take out of this whole next three slides of the whole geological time scale here, the number of extinctions, we're gonna count them together. The latest extinction, it's a mammalian extinction or the ice age took place about 10,000 years ago, which is 0 0.01 million years ago, which is 10,000 years ago. Then there was one at about 65 million years ago, which is important because that's when the dinosaurs basically assumed disappeared. <clears throat> about 250 million years ago, there was another mass extinction, which is important because what happens around this time, about 250 million years ago, the continent, the supercontinent, which was called Pangaea, started separating into two larger supercontinents, Laurasia in the north and Gondwana in the south. Now, this one eventually start separating into the continents the way they are today or the way we know them today. Now, this led also to mass extinctions. Why? Because as the continents start separating, animals get trapped here. At the beginning, when there was one supercontinent, they can basically take a little stroll from Russia all the way to Australia. I didn't have to take a plane or no car, no nothing, right? They didn't ex really exist 250 million years ago, but they could walk and interact with each other. As the continent starts splitting, basically you start getting separation. Now, once you start getting separation, animals get trapped. That's why today, basically in Australia, there is a lot of animals that are not seen anywhere in the world except Australia, because somehow when Australia separated, they got trapped right here and probably a bunch of predators for these animals here end up stuck somewhere here, here, or here. Now, this was the third mass extinction 250 million years ago. And these are the three that I want you to remember. The 250 million years ago basically was what, when was the continental, continental drift. 65 million years ago was the dinosaur and 10,000 years ago, it was the latest mammalian extinction. Then there were three more, uh, three more before that. And we don't really care too much, but remember in total, one, two, three, four, five, six of them. Six mammalian extinction or six major extinctions. So there is six major extinctions.
Now, if you notice right here, the Earth is about 4.5 billion. I said at the beginning 1.5, but I, I was wrong. It's 4.5 billion years uh, old, about 5 billion uh, years old, okay? Now, continental drift is one that played a major role in basically speciation or all these species getting trapped or all these species actually evolving. Why? Because as the continents separate, animals are trapped, they don't interact with each other, so now they basically start evolving differently. Uh, it's all different. If you have a predator around you or you have no predator, you're going to evolve completely different. Basically, if you have a predator, basically uh, um, you will end up evolving differently and much faster. Why? Because you have to adapt to certain conditions and you constantly have somebody chasing you. So who's going to survive? Only the one that will most fit. And we're going to learn in a minute about it. Here, what I'm trying to show you guys, you can see how the earth actually looks today. And you can see here, this line represent, represent tectonic, tectonic plates. They represent tectonic plates. What are those? Basically, the earth is still moving as we speak right here where these tectonic plates are. That's basically where we have major earthquakes a lot of the time. And if you notice right here, the arrows point how actually tectonic plates move. So if you notice, North America right here eventually is going to meet up with the Eurasian plate on this side right here. South America will end up somewhere right here next to Africa and the Indian Ocean. So that's all basically this one with Australia eventually will end up somewhere by past Philippines, somewhere by Japan right there. When? Million years from now, not tomorrow, not in our lifetime, not in our grandchildren's lifetime, but in millions of years. Now, out of the six mass extinction, there were two types of events. Each one of them was basically two types of events, meteorite impact and continental drift that led to evolution or that led to the separation or the extinction itself. Meteorite impact is basically when a me some meteors or like the latest one was in a meteor in Central America caused the extinction of the dinosaur. A meteor, if you go to a Yucatan Peninsula, that's where actually there's a big gigantic um, um, crater where the uh, meteor impacted the earth and created this really dust cloud which traveled everywhere, created for thousands of years or for a few, at least for a few hundreds of years, created like it completely covered the, the sun. There was no sun penetrating to reach the earth. Basically, uh, it was a complete uh, ice or complete um, coal for the long time. Um, continental drift is basically when continents separate. Now here, Darwin's voyage. This guy was a young dude in 1981, 36, when he traveled on the HMS Beagle to map the, the world. He was, a he was a naturalist and a biologist at the same time. Now here you can see his face looked like me but not really. And he traveled from Europe around South America, then eventually stopped in Galapagos. That's where he actually came up with a theory or, or developed or discovered or uh, um, learned from the materials that he brought from there about theory of evolution. Then he moved south by Tahiti, Australia, and then back to, to England. This voyage was about five years. Uh, five years. Here you can see his original writings while he was on the boat. They are exhibited to this day as the, as, at the UK Natural History Museum. And basically Darwin, while he was there in Galapagos, made a bunch of observations, not only in Galapagos, everywhere where he traveled. So what he no noticed, there were three main things that he noticed. First, fossil of extinct organisms resembled, they are not the same, but just resemble those that live today. Then he looked at the different geographical patterns and he noticed that as animals or organisms move into a new habitat, they basically gradually change. What does that mean? If you get an animal basically from Malibu and you move him to an area next to the Mediterranean, they basically look like it, but they're not gonna look exactly the same. I have a picture right here so I can tell, I can show you what that means. And oops, right here. 
you can see the ostrich, how he looks in New Zealand, Australia, Africa, Papua New Guinea, and in South America. They are part of the same family, but they just look a little bit different. Why? Because they have different habitats, which are a little tad, a tad bit different. So basically they adapted a bit different. So that's why they look the same, but not exactly, not exactly the, the same. So that's why it says that they change gradually. Now, he noticed also on Galapagos that islands have diverse animals and plants that are related basically to the mainland, but they are not the same. So how did he notice that? Because he looked at these animals, which are called the, these birds, not animals, these birds, mockingbirds. And he noticed that on the islands, mockingbirds are a little bit different. This is on San Cristobal. This is on Floriana Island. And you can see them here. This is what he collected basically uh, while he was on the island. San Cristobal, Floriana. Uh, I think this is from uh, Isabella and this is from Espanola. Now, when you look, they kind of look the same, but look at these parts right here. They are a little bit different. Even the beak, it's a little bit different between them. So basically he theorized that species are not very stable. And basically as they move out, out of their the one habitat to another habitat, they start changing. They basically evolution starts through natural selection. Here you can see also Darwin is famous for finches. Yes, he collected finches on uh, Galapagos, but the problem is he never labeled them. And when he got home, he realized, oops, I did not label them. Now I'm screwed. I don't know anything about them, where they come from. So later, other uh, scientists, when they go, or other travelers, when they go back, they labeled and they gave the name of the finches in honor of uh, Darwin. But Darwin actually did not come with a theory of natural selection based on the finches. It was mostly, it was actually based on the mockingbirds. So basically, <coughs> Darwin proposed the mechanisms of natural selection. Now the name, if you break it down, natural selection. You don't guys have to memorize this kind of stuff. Just try to think about it because in the exam, I'll give you the name. Natural, it means nature. Selection, it means nature selects. So who's gonna select? Who survives? Survives. So basically nature selects who survives. That's what natural selection means. Now his theory was published in this book, The Origin of the Species, 1859, and also can be summarized in a couple words, descent with modification or survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest, which natural selection, that's what it means, or descent with modification. Descent means what? Your descendants are your offsprings. Now your offspring or your babies are modified, are modified, or they are different than us. Why are they different? Because they are more adapted to survive. That's what we assume. Because adaptation, that's what it does. It basically allows only the one most fit to survive. Now, also, all species arise or come from a pre-existing species. There's no such thing that poof, I flip my fingers and I got a new species. All new species evolve from a different, from a uh, pre-existing species, different one before that. So it's pre-existing species. Now, before Darwin, there were a couple of scientists, Cuvier and Baptiste de Lamarck, Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, which had a little bit of funny uh, uh, um, theory. Cuvier was a catastrophe, catastrophist, which basically assumed or suggested that catastrophes were responsible for the drastic changes in living organisms over time. After each catastrophe, basically new species are created. That's not really true. It takes really, really long time for something to happen. So yes, could be a catastrophe, but it takes thousands of years for something to happen, not immediately, as Cuvier suggested. Baptiste de Lamarck actually suggested the evolution occurred as environment forces organisms to adapt, which sounds pretty good. Yes, organisms are, are uh, forced to adapt because of the environment. But the problem is 
that he used this theory, which is called acquired characteristics. What happens basically here, <clears throat> an example would be giraffes tend to stretch their necks. And this neck extension was passed on to subsequent generation, which means something like this. Here you could see Baptiste de Lamarck's theory. You see these giraffes right here, they reproduce. They have babies, they look exactly the same. Baby stretch their neck. Now, this is just by stretching their necks, they're gonna get acquire or they're gonna get longer necks. When they reproduce, they, they are able to pass that longer neck. Then they have baby, these babies stretch their necks even more. And now they end up with very long necks and the babies look exactly the same. You look at them, exactly the same. Some, something like this. I'm gonna stretch my hands and eventually I'm gonna reach my kitchen. Can I do that? Mm, as we know today, not exactly. I can stretch my hand as much as I want. My hand is not gonna get longer. It's only that I was born with the genes which will make my hand, my right hand a little bit longer. And this is what basically <clears throat> Darwin theory attests. You have these giraffes right here. When they are born, you notice right here, there is difference in their necks. Now, which one will survive? The one that are longer necks will survive. These ones are gonna go because they cannot feed themselves. They're gonna starve to death. Then these tall ones, the long neck ones, will have babies. Now, which babies will survive and which one will be more fit for savanna where uh, um, giraffes survive? In savanna, basically, the trees are very tall and because it's very dry there. More, there is two seasons, very dry, the 10 months, very dry season, and then two months, very wet season when there is like ponds and, and lakes actually form. Then 10 months, there is completely dry. So trees are very tall because they need to survive. If they are very short, everybody starts eating their, <clears throat> their leaves. <clears throat> so the longer or the taller the tree, the better the <clears throat> survival for the tree. Now, giraffes had to adapt. The one with longer necks will survive much better. Then they have babies. Only or most likely the one that have longer necks will survive because they can feed. The one with shorter necks probably will run out of food, they'll starve. And then eventually most of them will be the same, but they still have some type of variation. So remember, this is important for natural selection. Variation, this is the key. See right here, different necks, different lengths of necks. That means different or, or more variation. Now here, side by side acquired characteristics, basically there is same, stretch their neck, stretch longer. Darwin, variation, which is the first thing right here. Look at that, different necks, different length of their necks. So which one most likely will survive? One, two, or three? Most likely the two will survive and the three maybe. <clears throat> then this two is gonna pass its genes onto the next generation because this giraffe here possesses the gene for long neck. This one here does not possess the gene for long neck. Now, more individuals born than die. So more are born, more born, oh, sorry, the other way, born than dead or dying. Also, Darwin's theory refers to fitness, basically, Individuals inherit adaptive characteristics that favor their survival and reproduction. You have to be fit. Fitness, it means basically, I have to be able to pass on the good genes that I have. It doesn't matter that I have great genes. If I'm sterile, I am not very fit because I cannot pass my genes. Now, the last of his uh, rules or, or, uh, or, uh, or, uh, uh, regulations, it's basically, it has to, the, the, the genes have to be heritable, which means the baby looks like the parents. The baby looks like the parent. I can't just give birth to a dog tomorrow if I want to. It has to be a human baby because remember, evolution takes place very slowly over time. Now, what are the evidences for evolution? Fossil basically means that you look at the earth and you want 
dig up a bunch of stuff from there, a bunch of rocks or a bunch of fossils as we call them. And a fossil is what? A preserved remain, track or traces of something that was living. The study of fossil is called paleontology. So basically you look at rocks that have certain uh, uh, in, uh, encryption or I would say certain carving in it, certain, uh, uh, um, certain things buried in there, sediment basically, which will make that those forms um, uh, fossil in the, in the end. Here, fossil evidence leads us to conclude that hypothetically, whales today looked like this 60 million years ago. What happened here, we assume that over time, this hypothetical meso, meso naked skeleton, what happened somehow it became, end up in water, maybe when the continents start separating, only the one that were able to survive in water will reproduce, the other one will die. Then eventually 60 million, 60 million years later, it looks like the whales today. Here you can also see some uh, fossils. This is rocks collected from the Mount Everest, which is the tallest peak in the world. And they show basically marine mollusks. They're called ammonites. Now, when you look at this one, they look like a snail that one day was probably in the ocean. How is that possible to the top of the world to end up with something that was in the oceans back in the days? Why? Because basically, if you go back here, you notice as the continents moved, if you notice here, you see the Indian continent was somewhere here. And it was moving, it started pushing against the Eurasian and right here, that's where in this region we have the Himalayas and the Mount Everest. So this one, it keeps pushing, whatever was here basically ends up at the top of the, the world, which is the Mount Himalayas or Mount Everest today. <clears throat> Other evidences of evolution, biogeographical, which is basically shows that distribution of animals and plants that live in similar environments are unique. This is biogeographical evidence. Then you have anatomical evidence, which refers to homologous and analogous structure. Homologous would be here. These are homologous. Humorous, 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 humorous. Human, cat, whale, and bat. They are a little bit different, but all of them have humorous. Why they are different? Because they are adapted to what they do. This is flight, this is swimming. Cat needs about the same, has about the same thing, as same humorous as, um, as uh, human humorous. Now, when you look at the cat, look at the phalanges. Look at the carpals and metacarpals. You see right here, the carpals and the metacarpals actually don't even touch the ground. For us, it's part of the palm. For a cat, basically a cat walks on its fingers. For whale, these phalanges had to be extended. Why? Because it's this membrane that they need to swim. If they look like us, we can never cross the oceans. This one, these whales can cross the ocean and swim very fast because of the long phalanges. Same thing right here, a bat needs to extend its um, wings so it can fly. <clears throat> analogous structures, which I should have put them, but I don't have them here for analogous structure. Basically, think about a bird and a, and a, and a fly. Bird and fly, both of them have wings. Are these wings the same? or the same analogy, the same structure? Do they have the same type of structure? No, they are the same. They have the same function, they fly, but wings have completely different structure. Birds have bones, fly have no bones. They're just part of the exoskeleton. Another one would be grasshopper legs versus a human leg or a cat. Grasshopper or a bee, bee legs are different structure than the actual humans. Humans have bones, bees do not have bones. They have just an exoskeleton. Another evidence of evolution, it's biochemical. Basically, you look at the genes. Here is an example of it. We look at one gene, cytochrome C. 
And when we look at cytochrome C, we look at the amino acid difference between different organisms. Cytochrome C, it's part of the uh, mitochondria. Now, when you look here at human versus monkey, there's very slight, only a couple differences in the protein, but look how much difference is between us and human. A pig, human and a pig, there's way more. So basically pigs are further down the taxonomic level than the monkeys. Now, if you look at moth, yeast, complete, almost different for, that's how many differences are for the cytochrome C. That's why we are so different. Look at this versus this. So the more differentiation at biochemical level, basically a gene, the more different we are. Now, here we can see what Darwin went by his theory of natural selection when he summarized it as descent with modification. All these are finches right here, but look at the beaks. They're about, they look about the same face-wise, but look at the beaks. They look different. Why? Because it depends on what they feed. This one feeds on cacti, this one feeds on seeds, this one feeds on buds, and this one on an insect. Now, if you guys watch the video that I recommended you to watch for the exam, also, you have questions. You're going to notice that there is a finch there that actually pulls from the tree these worms right there with a stick. So this finch right here doesn't need a very strong, like large or, or, or a strong beak. It just needs something to just grab onto this stick right there. So basically, these finches have a common ancestor, but they just differentiate it based on the type of food they feed on and their beak evolved differently. Now, this is called adaptive radiation. That's what he observed in Galapagos, basically, later. Darwin's finches in Galapagos are an example of adaptive radiation. Adaptive means what? They move, as they move from the center towards outside, different food sources, they will adapt differently. Now, there is 13 species today of finches in Galapagos, 13 different species of Galapagos in uh, uh, of finches in Galapagos. All of them resemble the mainland finch, but they are not exactly the same. Now, what's interesting about these finches, all these finches that you see right here, they can interbreed and they can have babies, but all babies are sterile. All babies are sterile. The eggs are sterile. They cannot make new babies. They cannot lay eggs to make new babies. So basically, they cannot interbreed to perpetuate the species. So this one, the woodpecker finch, will mate only with woodpecker. Warble finch, would wa mate with a warble finch. Cacti, ground finch, cannot mate with anything else but to make new, uh, uh, to make to lay eggs, to make to get new babies only with a cacti ground finch. So that's what it happens. This is part of speciation. When one species separates from another, basically they cannot interbreed. You guys heard about an example would be, you guys heard about a liger, which is a mix between a lion and a tiger. A liger can exist. The problem with liger is that it cannot, it's sterile, it cannot have babies. Which takes us to the actual act of speciation. Now, speciation by definition is basically the process by which different groups of an organism evolve independently from one another, becoming a different species. Now, when you, when speciation takes place, members cannot interbreed from different species anymore. Only members of the same species can interbreed, can breed and produce fertile offsprings. For speciation, which is type of um, micro, macro, um, is it called? Uh, I forgot, I have a laptop, right, but it's going to come right. There's basically speciation. It's basically at the large level uh, uh, change, a large level change versus micro, which is a small level change. Now, there is two types of, or two mechanisms, allopatric, sympatric. Allopatric, A with B. Allo, barrier. Sympatric, SS or SL, sympatric, single locality, 
single locality. Now, what the heck does that thing mean? Here in Allopatric, Northern California, there is one species of, um, shoot, I forgot this one, no, two the name, salamander, species of salamander. As they start migrating towards south, in Central Valley, there's tall mountains right here. Some of them migrate towards east side, some of them towards west side. West, it's wet. East, east of uh, Central Valley, it's dry. As they migrate, eventually in Southern California, we have two different species. Now, basically, that's why it means by allopatric, it means that we set up a barrier. Barrier right there. This is sympatric. Oh, did I put sympatric? No, sympatric. Sympatric right here. Sympatric, it means that they're the same locality. You see right here, I say the same bugs, for the same two Aquariuses at the same locality. The same room I put them, but I put different food. Maltose, starch. Some of them feed on this. Some of them have better taste for maltose. Eventually, this one, they have maltose taste. They're going to multiply. This one, they have starch. They multiply. And at the end, they look different. A little bit reddish, a little bit different, a little bit yellowish. Now, when they make love, they make only with their own kind. Why? Because that's the only way they can actually um, reproduce. Now, I got some facts pretty uh, much of the internet for you guys here. What is the total length of time between speciation events? Basically, formation of new species. In a survey of 84 group of plants and animals, the time range from 4,000 to 40 million years. So to speciation to, to occur, it takes between 4,000 to 40 million years. Overall, the time for speciation, the average time, 6.5 million years, and rarely it took less than 50,000 years. So that's why when I talk about evolution, we talk about hundreds of thousands of years. Now, let's go quickly over some terms now that we kind of talked about it earlier. What the heck do we refer when we talked about fitness? Earlier, we talked that when you're fit, basically you have to have good genes, but you have to be able to pass them on. Pass them on. That's what it means, fitness. Now, uh, characteristics, basically the character that determines whether an organism is fit varies from population to population. When humans carry out artificial selection, basically now we select specific traits pretty much a problem. Why? Because now we artificially changing the fitness. Does it mean that they will survive? Most likely not. Why? Because it was an interference, human interference. Now, when you get natural selection, you just allow basically the organism to survive on its own. It's basically the environment that applies pressure. Here, it could be human. Here, it's nature most likely, or most of the time, this one will survive. Why? Because it's prepared, the environment put pressure and allow it to adapt or evolve. Now, we talked about convergent evolution. Convergent. Convergent means what? When two things are separated, they converge. Now, what happens during convergent evolution? Basically, similar environments cause similar adaptations. As I mentioned earlier, the one with the emu um, here, where was it? Right here, kiwi, emu, cassowary, ostrich. They have similar environment and then they similarly evolve. That's why it's called convergent evolution. Now evolution, there's two views gradualistic and punctuated equilibrium. What does that mean? Gradualism means that it gradually evolves, gradually evolves. Punctuated equilibrium, it means that 
it does not evolve for 5,000 years. It's the same. And then at 5,000 years, boom, this one here breaks into two different ones. Gradualistic, it means that it's constantly evolving. There is no, there is no basically, when you see, look right here, one from here, they constantly evolve. You see, they go from this orange to less yellow, yellow, eventually yellow, but it's continuous. Gradualist mean, it means continuous, slow evolution. Punctuated equilibrium, it basically means that it takes years before it starts breaking. Then this one is still going to go another 500 years, and then it's going to break off to evolve differently again. That's what it makes the difference between gradualistic versus the um, versus the um, punctuated equilibrium. Now let's go over and let's do, um, let's see right here, microevolution versus macroevolution. So here we can see now, what happens during those processes that I talked about earlier when I talked about speciation. So here we can see microevolution. Micro means very small level, which means at gene level. Macroevolution, which is this one right here, means large and basically means at species level. When a dog turns into a something, whatever else is going to be in the future, when they evolve, it's going to be a different species. When you talk about microevolution, it's at the tiniest level, which we don't see, but you will eventually lead to a new speciation. So microevolution leads to macroevolution in the long term. Now, before I move on to it quickly, let's learn these terms or remind them, remind them to you, DNA, nucleotides, genes, alleles, genotype, phenotype, gene form. DNA, it's basically the blueprint. Blueprint. Nucleotide makes up the DNA. Now, a nucleotide is made of phosphate, sugar, and the nitrogenous base pairs. Gene, it's basically a sequence of, of nucleotides. Alleles refers to the different genes. Genotype, it's basically the letters as we learned during the genetics. B, B, the variation, it's basically the allele. Phenotype, it's the physical characteristic, characteristic, characteristic. And the gene pool, it's basically, you have a population of a bunch of organisms and you look at their, all the genes they possess. That's what it makes us basically the gene pool. This is population, population we refer to when we refer about the gene pool. You look at all the genes that we have in a population. You see right here, there is some there. Most of them are green right here of these frogs, but there is one red, one purple right there, which makes up the gene pool. Same thing right here. You see all these uh, uh, pigs um, and basically you take their genes and put them in a pool. That's what it means. Now, talked already about microevolution, which leads to speciation. Microevolution is the small level evolution or change in a population at small scale. Now, for microevolution, there is five causes or five factors that lead to microevolution. Mutation, migration, natural selection, genetic drift, non-random mating. And we're gonna go over each one. So remember for macroevolution, the only one it's speciation. So macro means large, large. The only way you can see something large when they do different speciation. And microevolution, you can't really see that. 
because it's at the genetic level. Now, mutation. How can mutation lead to microevolution? Basically, if you have one single mutation, as we remember when we talked about uh, sickle cell, people with sickle cell, basically, they have a mutation. So they are a little bit different than us. They are still human. They don't look different, but their blood looks different than us. Here, you could see <clears throat> two of the green bugs right here. They made, and somehow one of them acquired this little brown, this little brown coloration right there, which makes it basically a mutation. Now, this mutation is the original source of variation, which will make us stronger in the future. Why did this uh, bug acquire it? I don't know, I don't, or we don't know why, but it might be successful in the future and help these bugs survive. Migration leads also to macro, my, micro evolution. How does that? Basically, what happens here, you take one of these brown bugs from here, you bring them into this population, they somehow, they will end up with fertile individuals then eventually the, all the offsprings are going to be uh, fertile. So basically here, migration allows the gene flow. This is genetic exchange due to migration. These ones are the same bugs, except that they have different colors right there, just slightly. They are fertile, the, off, uh, uh, the offspring. So now the offspring right here is going to look different. Here you guys can see an example of... Um, Gene flow is this river in um, Borneo. Uh, this picture was taken by one of our um, faculty at Mansak. It's Kina Batangan River in Borneo. You see right here, these little wires. Now these things right here on the wires are not shoes. Actually, they're monkeys. See right there? These are monkeys. As monkeys travel, basically from one side to the other side, they are allowed to cross breed, to migrate. Why? Because this Kinabatangan River blocked or starts splitting or separating the forest. This was man-made. So it's separating the actual, the two sides of the forest. What before was very easy for these um, monkeys to breed, now it became very much a, a, a live, and, live and die situation. So instead of... Uh, monkeys trying to cross the river and then die, they put these little wires across or these little uh, ropes, which allow them to travel across and interbreed and keep that gene flow going. Otherwise, what would it happen? You will end up with different species eventually in a long run. If there is no traveling, no gene flow, you end up with two different species in the long run. Natural selection is the third cause and basically natural selection means that the nature selects who's gonna survive. Here you see an example of moth. Moth, back in the days, this moth right here used to be in 99% of the population of moth used to be this color. As the industrial evolution occurred, a lot of this bark became very dark because of the pollution. Now, the one that was in very small numbers back in the days, what did it happen? they actually get to survive today. And this whole population um, number or the number of, of uh, moths that are dark or, or yellow completely flipped. You went from 0.5% to 99.5% of the moth today. It's dark, why? Because of this flipping, because the trees protect them, camouflage them. So here it was not that we selected, it's the nature selected who's going to survive. The birds, it's much easier to see them back in the days. Today, it's very hard to see them. And what do they go for? Usually they go for the yellow ones. Here, tortoises, it's another natural selection or adaptation as we talked at the beginning. The shell looks different. Where wet islands, grass, they look like this. They don't need to stretch their neck. Dry, no grass, they have to stretch for tall plants. Now, you guys don't need to know this part of natural selection, the stabilizing, directional, disruptive. I'm not gonna cover it because I'm not gonna ask you in the exam. So this part, you don't need to, to know it right here. 
but you need to know genetic drift, what it means. Genetic drift, basically, it means that it's alteration of a gene pool due to chance. Now, genetic drift takes place on a small population. Only on a small population we can see genetic drift. Why? Because if you have 50 individuals in a population versus a million individual, imagine that individual Mitch, which was in this population, dies or is gone, something happened, and Mitch was in this population. He dies also. Which population basically will have more to suffer? If I had the best genes in this population, probably out of a million people, there is probably another at least 20, 30, 40 with the same or with the genes that I have or closely uh, 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 as strong genes as I, as I had. In the 50, the small population, most likely there is no individual. So then if this individual or individual Mitch disappears or dies, it's going to affect the outcome of the population. Now, for genetic drift, we have the bottleneck effect and the founder effect. Founder effect, it refers to somebody when something is founded, like an island, a population all of an island. Mitch and Jessica go on an island and they start a new population. This is called the founder effect. This is going to be affected. Remember, if Mitch eventually dies when they start multiplying, it's going to affect the actual it's going to affect the actual uh, uh, pool, genetic pool. Bottleneck effect, what it does basically looks something like this. This is the original population, and then you have a neck right there. Only the one that can escape out of the bottle will survive. This is, again, the same problem as earlier. This is a small population right here. You can have millions of these little beads in there. So basically, drastic reduction population, uh, brought about by severe pressure, flood, disease, famine, habitat loss, blah, blah, blah. Now, the surviving population does not really represent the original population. Why? Because what happens here, you see all these yellow ones are still stuck in there and the white ones, only the blue ones come out. So in the bottleneck, the population outcome changes, the same thing as in the founder effect. The population effect, uh, uh, sorry, the population outcome at the end will look or would possess Mitch gene right there if he was the founder, Mitch and Jessica. And the last one, oops, I have it right there. Few individual establish a new population. And the last one is the non-random mating. Non-random, it means I choose. It's kind of like an artificial way. Non-random mating, basically selection of specific mate. Random is just, I just go out there and I select whatever, but non-random, which is actually more true in these days today, it's basically, we choose specific mates. What does that mean? There is two types of non-random, assortive and sexual. Assortive mating, basically you look somebody that looks like you, has the similar phenotype, tall with tall, Asian with Asian, black with black, white with white. With white. Sexual selection, now what you do, on this type of non-random mating, you just look for traits that increase the likelihood of securing a mate. Basically, you look for what it happens in, in most of animals. The choice, it's made by female based on the best phenotype. So females usually in animal kingdom, they choose the male based on their phenotype. Whichever looks stronger, whichever looks better. That's the one that I wanna mate with and that's the one that I wanna perpetuate the species. The weak one are always eliminated from the population. So these are the five causes that I just went over for microevolution and macro, remember, macroevolution was just actually speciation. That is the final product. When you went through all these causes and then eventually you end up with macroevolution which is speciation, speciation. And this is basically the whole, let me see.